Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the Juneteenth Forum, part of the Women in Government Talk series sponsored by Spectrum. I'm Cheryl Huggins-Salomon, Advisory Board Chair for City and State New York, and the Chief Communications Officer of the NYU McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from the great speakers we have here with us today. They're leaders in government and policy, and they're about to share their insights that you won't want to miss. The timing, a celebration of a date when formerly enslaved Americans learned they were free, will add an important dimension to this conversation. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce Camille C. Joseph Goldman, who is a Group Vice President for Government Affairs at Charter Communications. In this role, Mrs. Joseph Goldman oversees and manages all government affairs, strategic partnerships and investments, consumer protection and telecommunications regulation from New Jersey to Maine, which includes the company's large presence in New York State and throughout New England. Welcome, Camille. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And thanks again to you and City and State for supporting this series. My name is Camille Joseph Goldman, and I, I do work here at Charter Communications, where I serve as a proud group vice president. I'm servicing and helping constituents all the way from Buffalo, New York, uh, to Bangor, Maine. And key part of my responsibilities is to maintain an authentic standard of cultural competency through my leadership and our community engagement. And that's why I'm so honored to be here moderating today's discussion. I feel like I, to quote Shirley Chisholm, I brought my folding chair out today to sit alongside such phenomenal women who are blazing a path for all of us to follow. These groundbreaking women you will hear from today are a testament to the strides made in diversifying our state government and a testimony to the progress that we have made as a country. But as always, there's still work ahead of us and there's no greater reminder of what's been done and what yet we have to achieve than Juneteenth. 2020 marks the inaugural celebration of Juneteenth as a holiday in New York State. Much has been written about the day, its relevance, and all the celebrations to come, which is actually this coming Saturday on June 19th. The holiday has always been recognized and celebrated by key communities of color across the nation, but it's now being recognized legislatively by many states, including New York, and socially recognized by, by all people across the country. Last year in particular, we saw the escalation of very key issues centered on criminal justice reform, environmental fairness, and other social justice issues. Last summer's events galvanized people across our state and our country and shined a light on the fight for equality for all. The incredible women that we have brought together today did not just start with this endeavor, and they all in their own ways fought and understood the need for Juneteenth to be brought to New York State in an official way. These advocates and trailblazers we'll be hearing from over the next hour all have very public roles and influential voices, but most importantly, they have a strong commitment to advocating for equal rights to all. So thank you all today for joining today's discussion and let's learn together. Our first segment will include the woman, the myth, the legend, Dr. Hazel Dukes, an important civil rights activist since the 60s. Over the last 50 years, she has served as a civil rights icon and a leading figure at the NAACP, where she served as the organization's state president for over two decades. Dr. Dukes has led a distinguished career in public service dedicating over 25 years of work to New York City alone and serving as a leading voice against systemic racism and justice all across the nation. Mama Dukes, as we affectionately call her, has spent a great deal of her career mentoring young leaders like myself. She has also been a champion for improving education for black and brown children and views the civil rights movement of the 60s as unfinished business. And I just wanna say, you know, prior to COVID, I was blessed and humbled by the opportunity to spend time routinely with this great leader. Mama Dukes, I've missed our lunch dates, not only for the great meals, but for the incredible and incredible mentorship 
and powerful wisdom bestowed on to me by you. It is honestly a great honor for me to welcome you here today and thank you for taking the time to join this discussion. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this great group uh, to city and state, thank you. And to the, these distinguished women, my children, that you have invited to be a part of this great discussion today. I am pleased that the nation, uh, people all around are talk, is talking about the celebration of June 10. And for us as African-Americans, we understand it. And so we are about educating and bring resolve around this issue uh, to where we have, uh, when I recall looking at what happened in our Black Wall Street, 300 lives lost, uh, to see the resilience of a 103 year old woman sitting there who heard the smoke and the gunfires in the middle of the night. And then to see the, the people that you have here, the representatives of our state government, our women, who uh, in our little girls talk early, I said to them how proud I was that for the space that they are in, that how they have taken on the real issue of advocates for our communities and for New Yorkers as a whole. And so for me, 44 years in the NAACP, I'm sitting in the new headquarters in Baltimore, Maryland, where we are getting ready for our 112th national convention. And I came in to do my recording because it's have to be virtual again. But in the years that I have been in this struggle and mentor young women and men, uh, I was interviewed by Amsterdam News before this call about criminal justice and why we have fought so long and hard for it. And as I was saying to our uh, majority uh, uh, speaker there, that the kind of work that they said, even the speaker himself, I remember in one conversation, he said, if he accomplished nothing else during his tenure, it was to see that we reformed the criminal justice system. We started with raising the age. Do you know that New York State was the only state that treated our children like adults in the criminal system? Well, when we got the speaker and his leader, who he sent me to every time that I went to Albany, uh, he would see me and then he said, now make an appointment with People Stokes. I said, yes, sir. Because she was the leader that carried uh, uh, Walker and Hyman and all those other sisters to where we needed to be in that space and time. And so we have worked on issues that people are saying, well, NAACP is not a social uh, service. No, we are not. But our people need social service. And so we have to make sure that those agencies that are there, the parole system, that they understand that we, the advocates are here watching them as they deliberate and make policy about the lives especially of black and brown. And so that's been my life work education. You understand that uh, Camille, cause you have helped me in so many ways, gave us the first $10,000 uh, for uh, Albany for internet. And I was saying earlier on to Amsterdam news that when our young men and women come home, they have nowhere to go. Families have died out or in poverty, they can't support them. But yet upstate in New York, in the white community, they take our men and women and nothing happened to them, but they sit in jail cells. And so when they return home, they are not educated, they're not training. At one point during the time of Mario Cuomo, we had a system where 
we had men and women come returning home with bachelor degrees with GEDs. But now it's all about punishment. And when you look at the data and you see the same crime that is committed by whites and the black and brown, you can see that the system is unfair because we get a long sentence. We don't get to parole like other people. And as I said, most of our people go because we can't afford lawyers. And so when we did the bail system, it's nothing wrong with the bail system. It's wrong with the system. And so when our distinguished leaders work to do the bail system, that was a step in correcting the criminal justice system that is unfair. Most of our people see legal aid attorneys. And so they plead guilty because the attorney has 50 cases. They can't do what a private lawyer can do for the other, for the majority race. And so it takes the advocates, it takes our legislators to look at what is right. We're not talking about people who commit murders and rapists when the newspapers try to say that because our legislators, our black and brown people were saying it's an unfair system. And yes, the advocates, we were there with them saying, let's look at it. Let's humanize this system. When people commit a crime, we are in a civilized society. Punishment should be, but let's have equal punishment. Not just because a child didn't finish high school because the education system in our urban areas that they dropped out. But I can show you countless of young men and women who have been in a system and when they came home, they came home to a community, to a church family, to a family of aunts and uncles and just guardians. And they never have returned back into the system. They came home, they're productive citizens. They're working, they're married, they have families. But the stories are not told because we don't control the media system. And so we are here about Juneteenth, but we celebrate Juneteenth every day. Most Americans, even African-Americans didn't realize what this means. We talk about emancipation, we talk about celebration, uh, Columbus Day, all of those days. But here we are a hundred years later now, bringing to light what happened on Black Wall Street. Doctors, barber shops, shoe shops, beauty parlors, all that we ever wanted was there. And because of racism that still exists today, and that's why I have to continue, wherever racism raises ugly head, I have to be there to say, no, 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 not for the next generation, not for you, Camille Joseph, not for you, Latrice Walker, not for you, Tamika Mary. The baton has been passed to you guys. Now, you have shown us that you can run this race. You're intelligent. Your presentations are always on point. And so we now are reaching back to another generation that you will bring forth in this celebration of Juneteenth as you recount and review where we've been where we are and where we're going. That's what this celebration is going to be about. Yes, we're gonna review our history. Everyone else knows their history, but we're not gonna dwell on it. We've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go. And so we're going to remember, and we're gonna celebrate, and then we're gonna keep planning how we get from here to there. Thank you so much, Mama Dukes. And uh, you touched on so many key items, but one thing before you go, 
One thing I want to ask you about is being in New York State in particular. You know, we have literally the blessing to work with great leaders such as yourself throughout the state on these key issues. New York State also incubates um, some other key civil rights organizations, National Action Network, Urban League, um, right here in our very state within reach of all the people that we've gathered today. And in New York State, because of that, we've witnessed some great strides, as you've mentioned. In New York State, however, we've also witnessed Eric Garner. We've yes. also witnessed Daniel Prude. We've also witnessed a lot that, to your point, signals that a lot still has to get done. So I'm, we're going to raise this for our other panelists in just a moment. But Mama Dukes, when you come back next year and you rejoin this conversation as we commemorate Juneteenth and the holiday, what are some things that New York State still has to get done? And what are some things you want to congratulate the state this time next year on what they were able to do as we think about what Juneteenth means to us every single day? I want public education. Uh, I say over and over again that people send their children to the school that they won't. But for most brown and black children, they got to go to public education. So I want the equity in Harlem, Rochester, Syracuse, Buffalo. I was on with the Urban League uh, two weeks ago when they had the chancellor on, Chancellor Young on. And we have people fighting against, we're saying equity. We're not taking anything away from them. We're not taking any way for anything from Scarsdale. We're saying we want our children in Harlem. We want our children in Buffalo to have the same thing. We want all the resources to make them productive citizens. We want excellent education. We want the best teachers. We want the technology. All of that belong to our children too. And so next year, when I come back, I wanna see a higher graduation rate. I wanna see that all of our children have internet, broadband service that you have been, been providing, Spectrum. I gotta give you credit for what you've done. I, I worked with Capel to make sure doing the remote learning, I called on you guys and he responded to me. Mama Dukes, yes. I worked with the Urban League. I worked with National Action Network. Dominique Sharpton and I worked together to bring these points of issues. And our legislators, they heard us. And they said, look, guys, even, even the governor said to Verizon, look, you guys got to stop this saying that people have to pay $20 a month. They don't have it. They've lost their jobs, but their children need the service. This is the only way they're gonna learn. And so next year, I wanna see the graduation rate up. I wanna see that every public school, every child in their home, in the shelter, wherever they are, have the technology and the resources they, that they need to do this work. And then I wanna to continue to work on criminal justice reform. We know that we must save our children. And if we educate them, we will keep them from the behavior, the, the habits that they choose to make a living, some of them. Is it right? No. But they have to survive. And so next year when I come back, I want to know that we have clean air that our environment has been taken care of. Too many of my children have asthma. I wanna make sure that the healthcare is accessible, that people don't have to travel. What about our community health centers? They are primary to our community and people of competence, cultural competence. We need to have more our people going into the medical field. And so we must prepare them in their lower grades in pre-K. We must provide it for all our children. And so my list next year when I come back, yes, will be three topics. And all of the groups, the women that you have on today are working on that, are working to make sure that it's better than 
they found it and it'll be better for your daughter and for Latrice's daughter and for our children yet unborn. Mama Deuce, I can't thank you enough. You know, I send the board of the National Action Network with the Reverend Al Sharpton. One thing he says repeatedly, there is no leader like Mama Dukes. And when she's on the case, it will get done. So thank you so much for all you've done and continue to do seen and unseen for us all. And thank you so much for your comments on Juneteenth and the work ahead. Thank you so much for having me. Love you dearly. Love you more, Mama Dukes. Thank you. There we go. Thank you so much, Mama Dukes. And with that, we're gonna move on to our next segment this afternoon. It's a round table discussion that promises to be an informative one. Our distinguished panelists are all members of the New York State Assembly. Now, it's not lost on me that a month ago when we first kicked off this series, we highlighted the work of prominent black women who are trailblazers and advocates. And this afternoon, we continue with that very theme. Today, we have trailblazers from across the state whose tireless work for equality and parity embody the themes of freedom, liberty, and fairness. The premise of today's discussion that underscores the very meaning of Juneteenth. The sanction of this holiday and the great work that they did would not impede these women from joining me today as they continue their crusades to fight for their constituents, their communities, and all New Yorkers. With that said, please join me in welcoming Assembly Majority Leader, Crystal People Stokes, who has served Buffalo's 141st Assembly District since 2003. Assembly Member, Latrice Walker, who was elected to office in 2014 and represents the 55th Assembly District in Brooklyn. She also serves as chair of the New York State Association of Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislators. Assembly Members, Pam Hunter and Assembly Member, Alicia Heineman, both joined us today and assumed office in 2015. Assembly member Hunter represents the 128th Assembly District in Central New York, and Assembly member Heinemann representing the 29th Assembly District in Queens. Welcome and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, I like the background, Pam. Juneteenth. Pleasure to be here. You know, before I even get to my first question, one thing that our attorney generals mentioned earlier this week when we were hosting a similar conversation is that if you can't see it, you can't be it. So in particular for our young sisters watching at home, look at the brilliance of your state. You know, for me growing up in the Bronx, upstate New York was always Westchester, but there is life outside this planet called New York yes, City. There it is. And we have great leadership all throughout the state in our halls of government from Buffalo, New York, to Syracuse, Brooklyn, and Queens. So thank you all ladies for joining us today. Now, my first question, I'll, I'll you know, you know, have a little deference here because I want to start with our majority leader, Crystal People Stokes. You know, one of the reasons why Vice President Kamala Harris's historic ascension to the vice presidency was so significant for so many, because for some, this was the first time they've seen a woman of color in such a high position of power. However, from those of us in New York State, we're a little spoiled because we have great leaders like you. In fact, in 2018, our great leader, Crystal People Stokes, was elevated to the position of majority leader, becoming the first woman in African-American since the Assembly's inception in 1777 to do so. So, our majority leader, what is it like being a woman in key spaces of power, of influence in New York State? What are some of the, given your unprecedented ascension, what are some of the key challenges that you're facing and what tactics do you utilize to overcome them? Well, thank you uh, very much for that good question. And I wanna say, you know, thank you for the opportunity to even be a part of your um, initiative here today, particularly since it's uh, something that's very important to me, which is Juneteenth, nothing's more important to my culture. Uh, clearly I'm my God. Um, who didn't make a mistake by birthing me as an African-American. I'm supposed to look like I look, and so I'm unapologetic about it. Um, I will also want to honor my colleagues, too, you know, because I, I have the pleasure of serving with some of the most fantastic people in the state, and many of them happen to be 
uh, African American women, and I'm super proud, super proud of them, and super proud of the work that we do. Everything we do is a challenge as African American women. Why is that? Because we live in a society, in, in a country uh, that's basically a caste system. Quite honestly, everybody's put in a place where they're supposed to be, and where where people want you to be, I should say. And there's this thought process that you know um, we're not 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 white, and and we're not a man. And if you equate the way this caste system works in America, if you're white and a man, you at number one. If you're black and a man, you at least close. <laughs> I mean, well, you, if you're white and a man, you're two. If you if you're black and a man, you're one. If you're white and a woman, you're one. But we're neither one of those. And so it's a challenge every day to do the work that we do for our people. And uh, it's a challenge to me is, is worth taking. Uh, I will give nothing for it. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the speaker, you know, uh, deciding that I should be majority leader. I, I will tell you that, you know, in all of my whole life, I never aspired to be a majority leader. I, I never sought to be a majority leader. It just kind of happened. And I think that's clear, you know, conversation about divine order because there is a divine order to everything. And I think at the end of the day, um, God understands, the creator understands who is going to be the people who save this country from itself. And I personally believe that they look like me. They look like the sisters that I serve with because we're not gonna be the ones that judge everybody in a different way. Everybody's gonna get judged the same way. Everybody's gonna get the same opportunities and that's just who we are as people. And so, um, yes, they are, there are challenges. I am still challenged on a regular basis about my service, but I can hear it in one ear, it go out the other ear and I keep doing the work that I know I have to do for my people. And that's just the way it is. And by the way, I just want to, you know, give a big shout out to Buffalo. I'm glad you realized that there's something north of Westchester now. Um, but we have actually been celebrating Juneteenth in Buffalo since 1976. And so for me, it's always been uh, just an exciting time of the year to celebrate the culture, to focus on education, to focus on our history, and help our young people feel comfortable in, in their bodies, even though they go in to you know, some public education institutions on a regular basis where they're diminished because of how they look and maybe even how they're dressed. And so this is a time to build up black people around their value and the fact that, that we are free and freedom is not free. A lot of us paid a lot of price for that, but it's worth every minute of it. And if there's something else to be paid for to make sure that people who come behind me have the opportunity to be free, then I'm willing to pay it forward. No, thank you, Majority Leader. They're, they, they, we're, they're, we're free, they say, but when we act too free, there are often consequences. And we're very happy that there are leaders such as you that are in places of power that understand that and are fighting for us to enjoy that very freedom. And as you speak of challenges, I'm sure, that the other women and leaders that we have here today can speak to the very challenges they're facing. But one thing I thought that was interesting, and I'll move on to Assemblywoman Hunter, you, like every woman here, are thinking through kind of your demographic, how your race and how your gender plays into the politics of being a leader and plays into how you're able to be of service to your community. But I was actually surprised to, know, to learn that you're the only female veteran in the state legislature. So I'm just curious about how your role in serving our country more globally now informs your role in how you're servicing your community in Syracuse and how you're, how you're utilizing the strategies learned through your career in service to deal with some of the very challenges that the majority leader just mentioned. Um, wow, <laughs> that's a big question, uh, but thank you for the invitation to be here today and all, you know, uh, happiness and blessings to my sisters here today. I miss you already and it's only been three days since I last saw you. We were in the trenches uh, really deeply this session and it was great to just work with all of uh, my sisters here today. Um, you know, it's still kind of surprising to me, even after, I guess, uh, uh, my assembly line sister, line sister Hyman and I, this is our 
our sixth session, uh, but it's still surprising to me that I can still say I'm the only female veteran in the entire state legislature. And so when you're talking about, a, a, you know, 200 and uh, what is it, uh, 13 people, and you're talking about 20 million people in the state of New York now, uh, and just me, that's, you know, it's it's big, it's, 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 a, it's a big deal, uh, but we're just talking about service and it's just a different kind of service. You know, we took the same oath uh, when I pledged, you know, my oath uh, to the Constitution and the military, it's the same oath I took when I um, was in the city of Syracuse uh, Common Council and the same oath I took in the Assembly. And it really is about, for me, and this is just kind of my pathway in service, about discipline um, and about organization. Uh, I think anybody who knows me knows that those are the foundation of how I roll and how I get you know, things accomplished. Uh, but people always look at women and especially you know, women of color in, in two different kinds of ways. One um, is that they'll always have your back. And even when we shouldn't have to have someone's back, we always have the back. Um, and then also too, that we will always carry things to conclusion um, because we know that it's very, very important. And I think, you know, when we're listening to uh, the most wonderful, honorable esteemed, you know, Hazel Dukes, you know, speaking about all of the wonderful things that we were able to pass in the legislature and we still have things on the table and we always leave things, you know, at the door, um, hoping to get them done the next time. It's knowing that these are really important for our future, for the young people, for people who look like us, who aspire. You said, if you can see it, be it. Uh, we're trying to make it so that our young people, my young son, you know, uh, my sisters, you know, young children as well, have the, the great future that we want for them. But it takes a lot of hard work and dedication. And so uh, we're putting in double effort, as the majority leader said, sometimes triple, you know, quadruple effort in order to get a lot of things accomplished. But it's worth it. We have carried, you know, um, the, 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 the foundation of everything um, from our black brown and brown sisters, you know, forward that, you know, you're thinking about us picking cotton in the fields. And I was just having that uh, conversation with someone the other day. If anybody's ever actually gone and picked some cotton before and knowing what your fingers will look like after just a couple, <laughs> knowing you're doing it all day, every day, that is the foundation of where we came from. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. We're still talking about race and insurance. We're talking about race, you know, in banks. We passed laws, you know, today, uh, uh, this past week, making sure that there isn't discrimination in real estate. We're having these conversations still today. There's a lot of work that still needs to get done. Uh, and just knowing that the foundation of fortitude that came from my ancestors, but just knowing the service uh, background that I came from, uh, just gave me those background and skills to be able to hopefully lead and bring others with me and work as well as and best as I possibly can each and every day, you know, with the folks in the assembly and these great, great women that I work with in order to uh, get meaningful uh, pieces of legislation across the finish line. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. And one thing that your career in the Army speaks to, and something that the majority leader also spoke to, is the freedom that we all enjoy in this country and fighting for that freedom and respecting that freedom. And one of the freedoms that I know all of you um, not only know is important, but actually think about deliberately every time you go to session is the power and the freedom to vote. And unfortunately, across the country, there is an effort to restrict the vote uh, with a new wave of bills across the board. I think this January, this session alone in most states, we saw about 22 new laws enacted. So I wanted to ask Assemblywoman Walker, as the chair of the elections committee and also as the chair of the caucus, caucus um, what do you want to tell our audience about the, imp the importance of continuing to fight and preserve the power to vote and how this is so intrinsically tied to why we come together on Juneteenth. Well, thank you very much for having me. And you got some great questions. And um, it really just goes to really how connected you are to the issues, uh, to the individuals, as well as the communities that we all are here working to, to strive for the betterment of. Well, I am a direct descendant, you know, of slavery. Uh, I recognize too that they're even about to talk about putting a new place, perhaps even on this on the census. Uh, for people who are living in America who are direct descendants of um, involuntary servitude. And uh, my great, great, great grandfather's name was Guinea Charles. 
And uh, quite frankly, my family in South Carolina still lives on the very same land um, that he was enslaved on. And so the soil is still very real uh, for me. And just like with um, the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment, there were elected officials who put these you know, laws into place. Uh, elected officials put the Black Code into place and all of the other, you know, Jim Crow and, and everything else that we've dealt with. And so quite frankly, you know, it's the power of the franchise um, that allows you to put people in place who's going to espouse your issues and espouse your beliefs or people who are going to be looking forward to your constant um, and perpetual demise. And so the right to vote, you know, your, when people say your, your vote is your voice, it, they're not just saying that, it's because it is, right? And as you mentioned, there's so many different laws and things that we've done. Um, and it's quite frankly, because we were elected. And so we need more people um, to be out there to vote and to vote often and vote early. But again, you know, we think about the sort of Juneteenth while we're here. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation was passed in 1863. And the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865 and the, and the people, the great people of Galveston, Texas, who were formerly slaves, had been free for two years before they even knew that the Emancipation Proclamation existed. And so we heard that the same, the same dynamics are happening today. People are let out of our criminal justice system, whether it's Rikers upstate or anywhere else in the country without even knowing the basic rights that they have before them at this moment in time. They are given, if they're even given a Metro card to be able to get home and say, okay, see you later. You're left to, you know, to your own devices. They need access to housing. They need job opportunities. They, they need an education, not only for themselves, but also for their families. And they don't have an idea in many instances of all of the things and the tools that, are, that we fight for and pass to make it readily available for them to gain access to. And it, and it was not by you know, mistake. Basically, the 13th Amendment says that slavery was abolished except in the case of criminal punishment. And so the minute that you are punished for a crime, you are returned back into slavery in its truest form, right? Not just a mental slavery, but in whatever it was that was created at that moment, that's where you return, that one little thing, criminal justice. And so this is our liberation moment. And just recently this year, we had an opportunity where we provided or codified um, by the executive order by Governor Andrew Cuomo, which allow people who are on parole the ability to register to vote and to vote. And now it's law in the state of New York. Um, a very proud moment because I was told when I got elected that 25,000 people were returning from the upstate criminal justice system to my district alone between 2015 and 2020. That's 25,000 individuals who now, and, and some of them I was on the lines uh, when we were voting in the last election and they were like, you know, this is my first time voting. And I'm like, the next time you have to bring 10 more with you. And it's on us to be able to register all of those individuals. We are building re-entry housing right here in my community um, in order to be able to help them have some place that will lift them up so that they can recognize how important government is and how it works with them and for them and through them. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, um, uh, even with, with respect to sort of ACS and how that's almost a new pipeline. I know there's an education to prison pipeline, but there's a whole ACS to prison pipeline where we think about how women had their babies ripped from them uh, when they were out in those slave fields. And ACS is out here terrorizing my neighborhood, taking babies. And, it, and the country was talking about keep our families together. But yet and still, we are putting our babies back into foster care opening up this pipeline. And basically what it says to me that we have come a long way and we have seen great people like Majority Leader People Stokes and Speaker Carl Hasty and Majority Leader um, uh, Andrew Stewart Cousins, but we have so, so, so much further to accomplish. And, um, and the liberation mo movement and moment is still real. Um, and it still requires us to be abolitionists and to be out there holding the mantle and allowing opportunities for freedom for our people. Harriet Tubman said that she would she could have freed so many more if they had only known that they were slaves. And so this is our education moment to be able to educate, empower, activate, agitate, and then move them to legislate. So thank you so much. Again, I'm Assemblywoman Latrice Walker.
Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Latrice Walker. And let me just say, the importance of what you just said is not lost on anyone. She would have been able to liberate more people if they only knew they were enslaved. And there are so many people, so many people still, that struggle with the import of voting, why their voice matters, why they should engage, um, and which kind of leads me to my next question for Assemblywoman Alicia Hyman, because we're talking about the importance of bringing everyone together from all different backgrounds, from all di different cultures, um, thinking through, having them understand their freedom, their freedom to vote and the power of voting. And you mentioned publicly that you were born in England to Jamaican and Guyanese parents, yet came to realize as an adult that you were unaware of like, what this meant for you as a resident of this country and what you needed to do to become more civically engaged and more civically aware. And I'm curious, as the daughter of first-generation Americans as well, how did this experience shape your interest in shaping the Juneteenth bill? You know, explain to us what this has personally meant to you as an immigrant and why it's important of all, for all new Americans to learn about this importance. Well, thank you, Camille, for having me. And I have to say that the women that are, that's all spoke before me, I admire and we uplift each other on a daily basis. And I can't tell you what it looks like for leadership to look like you. And as you said earlier, if you can't see it, you can't be it while my daughter is buzzing around now in the background. Um, so I will say that coming to this country, I think my, my awareness of my blackness was, was definitely heightened when I came to this country. And in school, my mother always, you know, my mother's Jamaican, she's very headstrong, very independent, but she always, always said, you know, education was, was a tool to, for, to level a playing field. So I didn't learn about my black history until I got to SUNY New Paltz. It wasn't, you know, we never taught that. My parents made me watch Roots as a kid, but you know, when you're seven or eight years old watching that, it's very um, jarring because to understand your history and to understand that the same issues that we were having as slaves is still manifested in everything. And if you've, you've heard my sisters speak and they speak well, I uh, guess black women do speak well and they and do carry themselves well. And I think, um, for me, when I when I was in New Paltz, I took so many Black Studies courses just because any any elective I could take, I took a Black Studies course because I was learning about myself. I was learning why my parents had the discipline that they had. To, neither one of them went to college for sending us. And as an immigrant, it was like we came to this country, we bought a home. We did what wasn't done for us to make sure that your your brother and and, and yourself have um, have the opportunities that a lot of black people don't get, especially black women. So, you know, being in the assembly was not a dream I ever dreamed about, but it was the education that I had that catapulted me to this place. And which is why I've always been a strong proponent of knowing, being educated, but knowing your history, which would make the difference, I think, for a lot of our children moving forward is believing that they, that they come from greatness. And that's why Juneteenth, is so important for me. It's not a day off. It's I'm I'm happy. I'm elated that now this is a state holiday. But please know it's the history behind this holiday that means so much more because it'll be about about us, about our blackness at a time when we keep talking about people of color and 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 multiculturalism. We still have to talk about black people and where we need to go in this country, in this state. And I think that is, to me, the epitome of what this holiday is now moving forward, that our children will know our history, which is why I'm so proud of the Juneteenth celebration that will be taking place in Queens. I'm sure it will, it will, um, we won't match Buffalo just yet in the, in the magnitude, but for, for me, it's about our history. And as for an immigrant, it doesn't matter where the slave ship dropped you off. Because whether you speak Patois or you're from down south, we are all looked at as the same. And the slave masters, all they cared about was profit and free labor. And that is what was looked at when we looked at us. And even when you talk about, when we're talking about um, the 13th Amendment, and I, I tell you, when I listen to my sisters talk on the floor, Latrice Walker lays down the law every single time. It amazes me that the 13th Amendment was another way. So when our prisons are closing and our colleagues are upset, it's because we know that's less of our men and women that are incarcerated uh, around the state of New York 
The education for me will always be a core of us opening up and making sure that we know our history and that is what Juneteenth means to me. Thank you so much. And to your point, a recurring theme across the board and everyone kind of hinted at it even today is that when Juneteenth is mentioned, education and the value of education is never too far behind. And so I actually wanted to and I realize we're already running out of time. We should have booked three hours for this conversation. But for each of you, and I'll bring it back to the majority leader, thinking about the question that we asked for, uh, we asked of Mama Dukes earlier today around this time next year when we're looking back collectively about what was done in 2021. You know, Juneteenth is a call to action. It's not just a day off, as Assemblywoman Hyman just reminded all of us. And so what are you hoping to see across the states when we look back next year and say in 2022, we were able to accomplish this, despite the fact that we always know that more lies ahead and we have to do more. And whether it's education, whether it's other themes, you know, I want to engage each and every one of you about the importance of education because each of you has been a champion in this field for all of your constituents how communities of color are taught not just about Juneteenth, but their culture impacts society. But as we think about all these things, what is one thing or two things that you hope that we're able to laud next year that we were able to do together? And I'll start with you, Majority Leader, given your leadership, what are you hoping for? Well, you know, thank you for that question as well. Um, you asked some really, really profound questions. I, I, I have to start by saying that I think, um, the results of seeing George Floyd murdered in broad daylight uh, by a public servant spoke to not just the spirits of black people or immigrant people, but it spoke to the spirits of white people as well. Uh, I think that it, it allowed people to see that there really is a racist caste system that operates in America. And so for me, if we could get anywhere near in our state legislature, to having real conversations about race and its impact on the people who we're all supposed to be serving, uh, I think we will have made some progress in this society. You know, America doesn't like to talk about race because it doesn't want to think about itself as being racist. But if you think this through, there's not an agency within state government that does not have some people who come to work every day with a racial perspective on their mind. And by them coming to work that way, they deliver the service that way. And so we're really not getting the bang for our buck. We're not getting what taxpayers are paying for because there's blockages there because we don't wanna talk about race. And so I, I would love to, for us to have that conversation, even if we just start in our own state assembly with 150 members of that body to just get real and understand that until we fix this problem that people come to work with every day and help them understand that you know God is not a respecter of people and neither should you be. And by the way, you can't keep earning my taxpayer dollar if you're not gonna deliver the service in the way that it should be delivered because that's not sustainable. We're not getting to where we should be. So I, I, I would love to see if we could have some conversations, real conversations around race and stop running from it. And secondly, I wanna add my comment to that of Mother Dukes. Uh, public education, it's got to get to a place where it actually works for all of our young people. Now, clearly those folks who come from homes like myself and my colleagues and, and many people that you know, their parents enforce that education is critical and you have to do this in spite of the teacher telling you that you shouldn't take this class because you, you should, you're more qualified to take this. Their parents enforce the value of education. So just in case that doesn't happen from a, a young person's family or their community or, or their church, it has to happen in the school system. It has to happen there. And so I would like to see, uh, much like Mother Duke said, that we get a public education system that educates every child from a perspective of equity couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Majority Leader. And as we move on, 
I want to give everyone an opportunity before we bring in our keynote speaker, uh, Tamika Mallory, I do want to give the other assembly members an opportunity to weigh in on this. Assemblywoman Hunter, what are your thoughts? Uh, just very quickly, uh, there are two specific things. Um, one is to pass qualified immunity. It's a bill I do carry and I have a lot of support. And as uh, Latrice Walker was, was, was speaking about our, our constitutional rights um, and we're talking about uh, freedom uh, of people from slavery, we're still having institutional, foundational, systemic problems uh, with uh, race, uh, as the majority leader spoke about, and protecting our constitutional rights from bad actors is very important. So I would like to make sure that we pass qualified immunity. And secondly, billions of dollars have gone into all of our communities, states, communities, uh, relative to the American Rescue Plan. And I have said this repeatedly, and I will continue to say this. If our communities do not look better in a year's time for multi-millions of dollars that have gone into our communities to uplift people's housing situation, food disparities, if they're talking about rental um, situations where people are going to be at the doorstep of homelessness, if we have not impacted people in a positive way with all of these multi-millions, billions of dollars into our communities, then no money will ever fix the problems that we have. And we will truthfully understand that the foundation of our problems is not rooted in, in money. It is systemic racism and the, the, the willingness for people to want to make sure on a continual basis to keep poor people and the people of color down. Uh, could not agree more. Thank you so much. And I selfishly also want to underscore something you said because I think one thing that we've been talking about here at Charter Communications is also thinking through how that federal money goes toward bridging the digital divide. And so if we can come together and address that as an education issue as well, we honestly need it now more than ever. What you said, Assemblywoman, is true. We need to move and act fast. Assemblywoman Walker, thoughts? So um, I will say that, you know, we received $12.5 billion from the federal government. And so I want to give a huge shout out to, of course, all of our congressional leaders who helped uh, New York State do a gap filler um, because we thought this is going to be a doomsday budget uh, starting out earlier, the earlier part of this year where, you know, having to have conversation with all of our organizations about cuts, cuts, cuts. Um, but we had a we had a year of prosperity. And so, you know, very grateful to our speaker. Um, for helping to get us across that finish line where we close, we have a plan, a phase in plan for closing the equitable or disequitable, inequitable um, uh, education foundation a funding source to our schools. Like CFE was something that, you know, we were talking about from when I was a kid. And so it's like now to, to be able to think about the fact that that's being eradicated based on the fact that we have the resources to make it happen, I'm very excited about it. However, um, this is a redistricting year and um, we don't have section five anymore with respect to pre-clearance when we draw out our districts. And uh, we have an opportunity to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act of the state of New York where we would require that any changes to voting, redistricting, et cetera, would have to be pre-cleared um, since we can't get by the United States Department of Justice and Attorney General um, pre-clearance that we can do it right here with our own, our very own New York State Attorney General to pre-clear any plans. And if we begin to see the shenanigans that took place, even when, you know, I, I remember the year where they started adding districts in the New York State Senate just so that they can secure their own majority. And when something is so blaring and racist like that, um, when we see it happen, we can stop it at the front door. And so it is my hope that we're, we'll be able to get that across the finish line this year. So of course we need a lot of support um, from the community in order to make that a reality. So let's get that Voting Rights Act done, not just in Washington because we need the John Lewis Voting Rights Act down there. Um, but if we can't do it here, we can. We, there's a lot of work for us to do right here at home. Couldn't agree more. And Assemblywoman Alicia Hyman, can you close us out? What are your thoughts here? So a, a year, well, thank you, Camille. A year from now, when I think about our education system and how we have a, a black re, uh, chancellor of the Board of Regents and how we have a Latina who's a state education department and a majority leader uh, and people Stokes and uh, Carl Hasty and a majority, um, 
majority leader of the Senate, uh, Andrea Stewart Cousins, it tells me that immediately we can have each county can institute a curricula in our public education system system that reflects more of what we know is actual history and not revisionist history. That can be done immediately. Chancellor Young has said that, and it's important upon us as we talk about bringing more inclusiveness into our education system, New York State, each education department in this state can make the changes right now. They do not need SED approval, state education department approval to do this. And I would love each, each county to talk about Juneteenth and the actual history that um, Abraham Lincoln did not free the slave. He only freed the slaves in the 10 um, areas where that were in the Civil War with uh, you know, the Union versus the South. So I think immediately that can happen. The other thing I like to think about is in our correction system, how many black men and women are incarcerated who do not have access to higher education? It is not my bill, but I believe I'm one of the, the lead co-sponsors on getting TAP reinstated in our public institution, our, our prisons. You cannot tell me that the powers that be, because even though we have all of this representation, that they don't want our black men and women get into college degrees while they're incarcerated. Could you imagine if our prisons were really co correcting behavior with education? I mean, look at look at that. It'll be a rival to every educational institution in this country. So there's a I have a, a, a keen sense and awareness that this bill needs to pass next session, as well as all the other things that need to pass. This is Assembly Member Aubrey's bill, who has had this bill for many years. But for me, education will always be the core foundation. And Juneteenth to me can bring all of that to the to the to the top. Um, now that it's a state holiday in the state of New York, and I'm just really glad to be a representative just for the 29th district, but for, for these women right here, when I tell you they are my backbone, they lift us up. This is how the work gets done. You do not do this alone. You have to do this as a team. And I'm so glad I'm on this team. Thank you. Well, I want to first thank the majority leader and all of you gathered today for the work that you're doing. You've all noted that there's so much work to be done, but first and foremost, I want to thank each and every one of you for your accomplishments and how far you have brought both your districts and the state as we move towards progress. I also know, despite the long list of things that we've highlighted here today, with each and every one of you at the helm of governance, all things are possible. So thank you so much for the work you do. And thank you for continuing to inspire young leaders like myself. Because as I said before, when you see it, you can be it. Thank you all tremendously. And with that, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today and guest, Tamika Mallory. Tamika Mallory is a social justice leader, movement strategist, and author. I am, I cannot wait to hear about her views on Juneteenth and what it means for the movement today. She has a new book out called State of Emergency, but since I've known Tamika, she's highlighted the state of emergency that this country has been in and has brought to the forefront many of the themes that were mentioned today in a powerful way before it was socially acceptable to do so. I've personally known Tamika for over 15 years and take great pride in calling her both a friend and mentor. She works tirelessly at great sacrifice to herself for us all. And I wanted to thank her for that today and thank her for her time for today's discussion. With that said, I want to welcome Tamika Mallory to this event. Thank you so very much, my dear sister Camille. I'm so, so deeply proud of you. Um, and I've been listening in on the conversation today, listening to such incredible Black women that I know, many of them I follow, many of them uh, don't know that they're mentors from afar. Um, and certainly you, while you may think that we are uh, mentoring you, you've been really, really showing us what it looks like to be a boss uh, for a long time and to be someone who, uh, while you work in many different spaces, you are still uh, someone that has great integrity and a commitment to uh, Black people, to our people. And so I'm proud of um, you and, and glad to be with you today. There's not good lighting where I am, so unfortunately you got what you got, but, um, but you know, it's good to be with you. 
You look fabulous. Don't worry about the lighting. Um, Tamika, you know, I've said thank you, but I just want, you know, something that folks mentioned today, because we're talking about Juneteenth. We're talking about its importance for black people, no matter where you are in this country. And a lot of folks said, well, you know what? What's making it even more important this year is because of the year we survived last year with 2020, right? We, ha we saw civic unrest, right? We saw injustices across the nation, and in fact, right here in New York State. But one thing I thought was important to mention because of the work that you've done is that while it's important that what happened in 2020 is at the front of the consciousness of so many, what happened in 2020 is nothing new for a leader like you. We have seen this countlessly over the, unfortunately, and in many ways, it was brought to light, literally. When you saw George Floyd, people were so moved because they got to see it, but you've been talking about it for some time. And I'm curious about what this new renewed momentum has done for the movement and whether you see it as helpful or how it's been challenging for the work that you've been doing that predates this awareness mm. um, as you think through the work at hand and the work that you continue to do for us all. Right, so we've been sound, sounding the alarm, as you said, uh, for a very, very long time. And before me, there were others who sounded the alarm. I mean, when we think back uh, to Rosa Parks, that's what she was doing. You think about Ella Baker, that's what she was doing. You think about so many women, Dr. Dorothy Height, Hazel and Dukes, these are women um, who have been sounding the alarm for a very, very long time. And um, the moment that we're in today, you know, I, I like to uh, be hopeful. I like to try to lean towards the side of hope to see things in a more positive light. Um, and I would say that one of the most um, encouraging things about this particular moment is the idea that people are coming to the movement that have never ever been a part of and in many ways have not felt, honestly, they have not felt that this movement was even valid. Um, many of them have tried to discredit us. They've told us that we're crazy, we're lazy, we're whining. And now you're starting to see uh, those people walk towards this direction and say, I've been doing something wrong. I need to redirect my resources. As a corporate leader, I need to make sure that more of my money is going towards efforts uh, to help deal with racial justice. Um, as an, a philanthropist, I wanna be more involved. Just as an everyday average citizen, just a regular person, I wanna show up at the protest. I want to be more of an ally. And, and I think for us, um, what we wanna do in this moment is shift those people from being strong allies to real accomplices. People who are prepared to sacrifice just in the same ways that we do. Um, when I think about my life and the ways in which I live every single day, it is a sacrifice. You wake up in the morning and you don't know whether or not someone who um, is against our message uh, could come against us in many ways. Assassination is not just happening uh, physically. Assassination is also happening to the leaders of our movement and our character. Um, on a daily basis, we're seeing the trolling, the attacks, the bots, and others um, that are actually creating dissension in our movement. And in order, and it, for someone to deal with that every single day, it is a major sacrifice. And there are many people who, on a very, very local grassroots level, are sacrificing even more than me. Um, it is that deep that people are out there every single day, literally standing between white supremacy and, and oppression and our young people and our people in general. And so we are in a moment where we need all hands on deck. And I think there are more people across the world who see this movement as being something that is, is a priority to them. And we have to make sure, unfortunately, that we engage those individuals. And I say unfortunately, because educating people all the time also becomes a job and it is very taxing on your mind, body, and soul to have to explain your existence and also to explain, explain the constant oppression and the, the, the challenges that we face as a community. But when people show up at your home and they want to visit, you have to let them know what things are, um, are, are acceptable and things that are not. You have to let them know that in this house, we don't wear shoes across the floor. We don't put our, foot, our feet 
on the couch, as grandma would say. You know, we don't put glasses down on the table without a coaster. Um, you know, we keep the bathroom clean. These are things that unfortunately we have to educate people who are joining our spaces about. And I think right now we're in a moment where State of Emergency, my book and many others are necessary because people with new eyes need information, some of it old information and some of it new information that they can use to be a valuable, a valuable part of this movement. I couldn't agree more. I'm going to get to your book in just a minute. But another question I want to ask you is, you know, we had some stellar leadership from New York State on earlier today. And one thing that you mentioned to me years ago is that sometimes the conversations become more difficult when you see your friends and allies actually assume elected office or actually assume positions because you want to work with them and partner with them. But to be authentic to the cause and the movement, you also have to hold them accountable. And so one of the things I think that you've done very well, and I want you to share with everyone who's watching today, how do you, if, when elected officials come to you and leaders come to you and say, Tamika, how can we help? You know, how can we partner with you? You know, as we think about the importance of Juneteenth, I even ask folks, like, what are you looking forward to saying next year when we look back and say, I accomplished this? Yeah. What are some of those things you hope they say they accomplish and how can they work and partner more closely with key organizers like you on the ground to make sure that the community voice is not only heard, but the community is mobilized with them to get the work done? Well, first of all, most of the elected officials that I know particularly, and even the ones that I don't like, <laughs> they know what needs to be done. They know very well what needs to happen. They just have to have the will and also the courage to stand up and to be um, strong accomplices, again, of our work, of our movement, and of, um, of our people. Uh, and unfortunately, too many of our elected officials are not just, you know, some people like to say, and they make it real deep. Oh, they, they're sellouts. No, they're not even that. They're just scared. They're scared to stand up. They're scared to stand out. They're scared to go against those established uh, individuals who control the way that the ping pendulum uh, swings within state legislatures and even local um, offices. And I think what we're seeing now, when I think about someone like a Brian Benjamin, a state senator in New York City, and I know on bail reform, on uh, marijuana, um, on so many issues, raise the age. These, this is an individual who was there actually helping to push for some form of radical change. And we're still not even close to where we need to be. And I bring Brian up. And just as you said, I am constantly holding him accountable. I call Brian, poor Brian. He gets a call from me in the middle of the night telling him all the things that he's not doing right and promising him that I will protest outside of his office if he does not go back and tell the governor, X, Y, and Z thing. Same thing with Jamani Williams, the public advocate in New York City. I am extremely hard on Jamani. And I know sometimes he's like, yo, you got to give me a break. But actually, no, I don't because I help to send you to um, your office, to the position that you're in with expectations that you were going to double down and be even stronger than when you were a candidate because now you're actually in office. Um, we need legislative change, of course, but we also need people who are standing so firmly with our communities that other folks know we can't play around with them. We have to give them what they need or else there will be a price to pay. And only those who are in leadership can help us to make that position clear to those who do not support our communities. And so, yes, we do have to hold our friends accountable. You know, I'm someone who, and I, you know, I won't turn this into a, a political conversation, although we are actually in the midst of a, an election in New York. Um, you know, I have a friend who is running for mayor, uh, someone that I love, someone that my family has supported and loved for many, many years. I know this person deeply, but their position on policing, I don't align with. So unfortunately, I'm not ranking that person in this election. 
Um, unfortunately, I have to make a very public statement about why uh, their rhetoric, tone, and even ideals around policing are problematic and even dangerous. So there's unfortunately not a permanent friend situation. And, and, and while we may always be friends, you get the point of what I'm saying that we still have to stand up and speak out and be true to ourselves. Now, there'll be some people that will hear that and they'll say, yeah, but you didn't say anything about when your girlfriend knocked down Joe or when you're the guy that you know very well, you know, left his girlfriend or whatever, things like that. And what I have to explain to people all the time is there's a very big difference between holding the elected officials accountable and meddling in other people's personal business. It's very, very different. With the elected officials, they have a responsibility and we are we should absolutely hold them accountable. But what we should not find ourselves doing is tearing down other black people in public just so that folks who have a who believe that uh, the dissension among us is pornography, because that is what is happening, that people are addicted to watching the constant lynching of Black folks. And so that is not something that I like to participate in. But when you run for office, it's all bets off. The table is wide open for us to be able to hold you accountable because it's just too serious. So unfortunately, if you get in the position, you actually have to do the job or you're going to have to face the fire of leadership. And I think, well, first, let me just say, I remember many years ago, I worked for an elected official and you gave me a call and you said, we're getting ready to organize outside your office. And I was like, I thought we were friends, Tamika. You're like, I'm, I'm calling you because we are friends. I could have just shown up. Absolutely. And so I, I hear you. But One you, thing I will you say. Worked, but you said, okay, I have another plan. Rather than <laughs> protest and outside the office, can you come inside and Exactly. Explain? And we did that. And, and we, we had, it was a difficult meeting, but we had that meeting. And so, and I mentioned it because, you know, part of the reason why we selected the leaders that we did earlier today is I think that from our majority leader um, to Alicia Hyndman, Walker, and Hunter, they've really stepped forward and pushed to have the narrative that you've, you've spoken about. They're not afraid of accountability and they want to lead in, but the work cannot be done by elected officials alone. So for those who are watching and they're like, I'm going to, I'm going to think through how I'm commemorating Juneteenth. I'm going to think through how I'm going to support the efforts that Tamika Mallory is mentioning from until freedom and other endeavors for folks watching, what is one thing they can do to support a real task, a real item. I mean, I'm going to say, they should run, not walk to grab your book. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about that book. But what is one thing if the, for the person wa is watching saying, I work in corporate affairs. You know what I mean? I don't do marches. That's not me. What can I do to support this? Because clearly I'm involved. Yeah. What can I do? Well, I can't say just one. I got to give you two. One is um, they need to go get a voter registration card immediately and put it in the hands of a young person who needs to be empowered by having... Um, their voter registration card to say that I am responsible for why you're in office and therefore I can demand that you do things on behalf of my community and to address the issues I care about. So that's one. It doesn't take anything for people to go to the Board of Elections office or to lead a young person that they don't know online to figure out how to get registered. That's one thing I, I, you know, I think is so, 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 so deeply important. Of course, supporting the book and all those things uh, are, are important to me and necessary. But to support the work that Until Freedom is doing, and not just my organization, but so many, when I think about Life Camp out in uh, Queens in Southeast Jamaica, you think about A.T. Mitchell out in Brooklyn um, with Man Up, you think about uh, some of the other grassroots organizations that's doing anti-violence work when we're in the midst of um, the, the pandemic backlash, where you see shootings rising across the nation, what we know is that more policing is not going to solve that problem. It may make you mentally think that something is being done, but the truth is that the only thing we can give people who are desperate, people who are, who are, who are literally a danger to themselves and our communities in this moment are jobs, 
resources, mental health support. And there are groups out here who are providing things like that. They're feeding uh, young people and feeding folks every single day out in communities, still trying to keep through this pandemic efforts um, going to make sure that people are not feeling desperate and hopeless. Um, we need to make sure that we invest in those, in those individuals, those organizations, those institutions. And Until Freedom is one of them. We can't do the work that we do without money. There are people who believe, um, you know, because Black Lives Matter National uh, received uh, $94 million in donations, that it means that the rest of us had that type of money as well, that it couldn't be further from the truth. We don't have it. We need the resources. We need the support so that we can continue to do our work. Um, and as we you know, go towards Juneteenth, as we are now um, all much more aware, um, we're using, as you said earlier, the idea of Juneteenth as an educational opportunity to teach our families, to teach ourselves more about our history and to get more connected as a community. I've not seen a Juneteenth where I literally have um, uh, a music, what, what do they call, not music industry, what do they call, labels, music labels, um, other celebrities uh, reaching out, asking what events do I have going on for Juneteenth so that they can plug artists and others in. These are folks that in the past, when we tried to get them to support Juneteenth and efforts like that, they were unavailable. It wasn't cool. It wasn't something that they wanted to do. But I think now people are understanding that you can't send your agent um, to get your justice, to get your freedom, to secure equity for your people, that it takes you, your skin in the game. And I would say that as we are so conscious about this date, this holiday um, that we need to be celebrating, we also must be conscious about where we're placing our resources and our time and make sure that our money and our, and our efforts are matching the energy um, that we feel is necessary in order to push for change. I think we're in a pregnant moment, Camille. Um, we're in a moment right now where uh, we have the opportunity to really shift this country because we did elect a president and vice president and also two particular uh, senators who help us to at least uh, somewhat balance out what we're seeing in our federal government. But we've got to push them. They're not going to just, it is not politically expedient to do anything for Black people that makes our oppressor angry and they have resources to push back. And I think, you know, if we um, are, are really defiant and strong about how hard we're willing to go and the fact that we're not going to say that because uh, uh, a President Biden and, 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 and Vice President Harris are nice people who smile at us well, that we're going to let them off the hook, that instead we give them the same energy that we were giving to the previous administration if necessary until we get things like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed until we get an anti-lynching anti, anti bill, until we ensure that voting rights are protected, until those things happen, they don't get a pass and we don't get to sit down and get comfortable. So I think that's what the Juneteenth message is. It's also the message that's in my book, State of Emergency. I go through all of this and I talk about how important it is for us to push even harder when we have friends in high places that can literally get things done. And so I hope people pick up the book. I hope folks will support Until Freedom. I get a check for $50 from a woman every single week um, to support our organization. And we appreciate that $50 just as much as we do the $5,000 donation because the $50 keeps us going. So invest in us um, and invest in yourselves. Let's invest in freedom all together because it's going to take each and every one of us to get us where we're trying to go. And my last question for you, Sis, is, you know, I was thinking about Juneteenth, it's a moment in history. And I always believe the best way to celebrate black history is to make black history. And you've done that with your book. So I'm gonna give you one final opportunity. What is the biggest takeaway that yeah. you hope, because let me just say this, particularly for women and women of color, black women, we often let our stories be told. 
We don't get to memorialize our vision. We don't get, especially for you, memorialize our vision for the country. So you've made history in this moment. And as folks go to pick up your book, what is the one thing you hope every reader, no matter their background, no matter their goals, the one thing you hope they take away based on the work and the effort and the love you poured into this book? What well, is they it? don't have to look far into the book either. And hopefully um, they will. But you can just look at the beginning where I start out with the conversation between Cardi B and Dr. Angela Davis, where Cardi B is asking, is there room for me at the table next to you, Dr. Davis, in this movement? Um, I'm not buttoned up. I don't speak as well as you do. Um, I don't know all the right language to use. And sometimes I say things that are just wrong. Um, and, you know, I'm out here twerking, right, for a living. Um, is, that, is, that, is that okay? Is there room for me? And, and the affirmation um, that Dr. Davis provides to Cardi B to say that um, her role in the movement is, is important, um, it's critical, is so important to me. I was intentional about bringing the two of them together because I wanted State of Emergency to be an opportunity for Ray Ray from a street corner, Keisha who might be on a pole, to read the book and to get the same from it or at least to get the same encouragement as a pastor, as a lawyer, as a doctor, and that a mother and her teenage son could read the book and come together in conversation. So if there's one takeaway is to know that this movement will take all of us and that none of us in our bougie worlds, because certainly we live in a bougie world, um, and, and you know that, you and I live there together, but we also have to step out of that world and make sure that we see our people and that they, and that they know that they must be the center of our solution-based findings, that the people who are most marginalized have more information, more education, and more knowledge about what has to happen than we do just because we've studied these issues. We have to give those who have lived experiences a front row seat at making change. And I think that's what's in state of emergency all throughout the pages. And I hope folks will get it, read it and use it and then turn it over to another person that you think may need the content. So Mika, I can't thank you enough. And then for everyone who's watching, who may be even new to you as a leader, let me just say this. You can pick up you know, a mainstream paper, you can turn on the television. We may see you with the highest celebrities and highest officials in the entire nation. But for young girls like me from the Bronx you met years ago, you've never forgotten us. And for those young girls who don't know you, you're still fighting for all of us. And I really want to deeply thank you, sis, for all that you continue to do, for bringing us all along with you along the way. I joked and I called you like, you picked up. I think you're too busy. No. <laughs> but I want to thank you for everything that you've done, the love that you've poured to the community and the way you inspire young girls like me. You know, Tamika, sis, thank you for everything. Absolutely. And I pick up your call because you are important and you always remember that. <laughs> You are important. Thank you, love. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And with that, I want to thank I want to thank uh, Hazel Dukes, Mama Dukes, for bringing us into the, uh, the beginning, for table setting the importance of Juneteenth. I want to thank all of the elected officials that we gathered today. And I also want to thank our featured guest, Tamika Mallory, for what she brought to the table, bringing home the import of Juneteenth across the board, not just as a day in history, but a call to action. With that, I'd like to invite Cheryl back from city and state to close back the event on behalf of Charter Communications, as you know, as Spectrum. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you, Camille. And thank you all so much for joining us today. As our speaker said, Juneteenth is not only a celebration, but it's an educational opportunity. And the words of wisdom we heard here today were truly inspiring. And as the speakers also said, uh, it's important to be aware of your own liberation and to take civic action to protect it. We really appreciate all of the leaders who joined us for taking the time this afternoon to share their insights as women in government. I'm Cheryl Hubbin Salomon, uh, Advisory Board Chair for City and State New York and the Chief Communications Officer for the NYU McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. Many thanks again to Spectrum for sponsoring this series. We hope you enjoyed these speakers and will join us for future discussions. Enjoy the rest of your day.